The following podcast, I sat down with Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, who is such a fascinating person. Um, he heads the Possible Youth Seminar. Um, he created it. He We talked about incredible uh, self-growth and a lot of really, really cool topics. I know him originally as the surfing rabbi, and he is such a fascinating person. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Remember to like and follow. It really helps. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast. And now, your host, Sonny Perlman. Great. How about that? We're live. I've been told by my son, if you clap, it's easy to get everything synced up well. Um, <laughs> good son. So, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. I had a... I, Okay, I got the honor of seeing you on Shabbos. You are on my list of people that I wanted to reach out to in the future. Mm-hmm. And I've been very much not reaching out to people in our Israel because I don't know when they're in town or anything like that. So, and I have a huge list of American people. So, I got the honor of just setting this up on Shabbos, which was amazing. No, nah, Shabbos great. But <laughs> we <laughs> met on Shabbos and... <laughs> We met on Shabbos, yeah. and we were able to connect after Shabbos and set this up. I'm really, really excited. Um, I know about you forever. I think we've only had one or two conversations in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember them very well. <laughs> I don't I don't know you, you uh, if you remember them so well. But I've always been fascinated by your work that you're doing from a distance. And I had a lot of questions about it. Um, and some of the questions about you. So... But the context of this podcast is usually a conversation. So if you have questions great. the other way, it's great. Um, I don't like the uh, the interview format. I ask a question, you answer a question. It, it should be conversations. So that's really, that's it's called brainstorm. We're trying to figure things out. So nice. that's the idea of it. So I'm just really excited to have you. So thank you for coming. Welcome. Okay, so um, we'll we'll start off right off the bat. Interestingly, um, it wasn't you, but there was a surfing rabbi. Did you become a surfing rabbi at some point, or it never happened? Because you was a surfer. It was a guy named Nachum Shifrin. Shifrin. Shifrin was a Chabadnik who was like the surfing rabbi. I now I remember who it was. World friends and surfer friends. And and oh, I met him in I a made scent it very in clear spot. To him many times that he's the surfing rabbi. But you didn't. You I didn't take over age, the mantle at some well, point. It could be our age difference because he's older than me. It could be that that as he, you know, it could be he's he rode off into the sunset a little bit. Yeah, right when my star was rising, you know. So and people know I surf a lot, so. right? So, okay, I always thought you were the surfing rabbi, but now you're mentioning him. I remember I met him in Ascent in Svat. He used to be out there. It's possible. I think so, yeah, and I think I even was with him in Svat a few times. In Oh, wow, okay. I'm on my way to Svat this Friday for Shabbos Lagba oh, yeah. I'm going to be staring at Rabbi Shimon. No one's going to Mehran this year, right? Um, well, I mean, very select few that the police are letting through, like the Biana Rebbe and like a minion of men. Here's a, this is me surfing here. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Look at that. This is a recent picture? Yeah. See the pace. Oh, I lost it. But All right. Oh, it disappeared. I see yeah. the pace. <laughs> so you, are you still actively sur- surfing? I do. Surf. Like I'm saying, you go surfing surf. occasionally? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I want to get rid of it, really. Really? It's kind of a rough sport when you fall yeah. in the middle of a washing machine. And um, every sport, and especially extreme sports, require... Muscle memory. And what is a good basketball player? It's muscle memory. Right. So surfing requires a lot of muscle memory. It's not just your arms for a shot. You know, it's like a lot going on, especially when you fall. Right. And um, and how you fall. And, and if you don't surf a lot, which is me in Israel. Right. You know, the waves are, you know, I got a report this morning that it's going to be good in a few days. But it's the Mediterranean. You know, it's a little fickle. It's, it's uh, hard to get it good. Right. And so... I, I'm not going to bother in my schedule to go if it's not really good. So then I wind up only going when it's really good. And I've noticed that my muscle memory is worse and worse over the years. And I'm a mountain biker. Oh, okay. It's a much more faithful lover, mountain biking. 
because it's always a mountain. Right. (laughs) Right. You don't have to wait for the mountain. Right. Unless it's muddy. You know, we don't go in the mud just to protect the trails and and our bikes. So we just kind of having a bit of an identity crisis. Not identity, a sport crisis. A sport crisis. Well, it's amazing that you still do in sports. I mean, it's like so deeply. And I was when I was a kid, I was into all the sports, and I am into none of them anymore mm. at all. I'm only eating. I do competitive eating. Uh-huh. I'm. I have an. That's a joke. <laughs> I don't eat. Yeah, I, I, I miss just, a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said it's. I do competitive. That's eating. your sport. I, yeah, yeah. I just. I'll beat anybody at the table. <laughs> yeah, I'm just. I'm always in a competition. Sorry. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm stimul. I. Lack inner stimulation. Uh, always have. Like, quickly bored. Oh. And the sports, I think when I'm doing extreme sports, like I'm really coming down the mountains in Jerusalem with, uh, f- I'm in full body armor and like going down stuff, you need ropes to go down. And I'm on a bike. The, um, I think I start feeling what it is to be a normal human being. Right. When all my adrenaline's running. Then you feel the most human. Like no, then I feel just normal. Oh wow, I'm, that's I'm, what we call addiction, by the way. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> if, if, I, if I wasn't from such a non-addictive personality family, I'm I'm from like I don't know what it is. I haven't met really anyone like my family, but the Glazers are like non-addiction personalities. It's not we haven't had an addict in the family in like three generations. Really, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. Everyone when it comes to, and they're all like happy to tie on a buzz. My right. uncles, my aunts, my my aunts. I don't know how much they died on the bus, but right. <laughs> all my all my uncles, my parent, my father, his father, my brothers, all my kids, all their kids. But n- non addictive type. Yeah, they're like, they're that's like, a good and sign. And they'll do anything. Like the, they'll do anything once. Ask them again in a month. Maybe they'll do it again. That's really interesting because that means you're coming from a place where there's a there's a. a somewhat confidence there people are happy with who they are i mean that's i'm i'm making assumptions but i don't know i don't know what it is i'm meaning for the side of science you know medical science it says addictions and like a disease that runs genetically yeah so what i'm saying is maybe we just don't have the gene but the uh but for the side that says it's psychology right well i say then it's maybe both. we do have what you're saying is is there's a confidence or a Self-esteem, perhaps. Right. I have. I I'm have. I do believe it's both, and this yeah. is this is my field, and and I will say, and they may be equally both. Like the addicts are always sensitive people. That's the best way. Sensitive or or spiritual people. That's mm-hmm. what you know. That's the they, they call it addiction because that often becomes addiction. Emotions become incredibly difficult for sensitive people. It's it's so that's the way I describe it. And other people in twelve step program definitely have issues with the way I describe it, um, but the nurture part is about self esteem. It's mm-hmm. it really is the higher your self esteem is, the less you need an external self esteem to make you work. Right. So it's like this: like uh, if I if I can make it work from inside, I will. Mm-hmm. But if I can't, I gotta grab something outside. I have an so. interesting question for you. Maybe yeah, you can answer. Um, I, you know, I live in Jerusalem now for I don't know how many years, but three years and my question is um, and I've certainly met plenty of addicts in Jerusalem and tried to help them as well Um, my question is I notice that addicts come to Jerusalem because I I worked for Asia Tour for for 29 years and we certainly received plenty of people in addiction right I noticed the recovery rate without any recovery program was way higher in Jerusalem. And again, this isn't a perfect uh, scientific model here because it was Bali Chuva who were finding God for their God-sized hole right. in a way that's on steroids compared to an AA meeting. I mean, you're like, you're like becoming from like your entire lifestyle is having this gigantic transformation. Right. A discovery of God, which is epiphanous, and a and a surrendering of your entire lifestyle to this new lifestyle of being from. But I, I did notice that that it knocked out, I would say, th- 
four out of five addicts from addiction. Like just from your observation, like it was over the meaning for long term. Meaning these right. people are the people I originally was with are they're making weddings now. They're completely non addicts. There is the one fifth. <laughs> right. There's some really dear friends of mine and they're they're struggling, but the um, or they're good, but they're you know, working. Well, there's a there's a whole bunch of pieces here. I'm not Did sure exactly what Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I so it doesn't make any sense, like especially from from a twelve step twelve step perspective, they're not yeah. working a program. Sure. These guys are just getting better. Right. So there is there's a whole bunch of pieces here that are that are, and I've spent so much time thinking about this because I run our place, which is six seven hundred kids a year. That's what we I run in Brooklyn. This is a smaller program that I run here, but that's that's so I'm sending kids to Israel and rehabs all day long. That's not all day, but. That's what we're doing. Um, so I'm analyzing, like, what's working, what's not working. And we've had an enormous amount of success just sending people to yeshiva. And there's gotten a bad hype um, to, like, send people to Israel. Like, you know, like, in the, in the community, it's like, don't send your kids to Israel. It's too high a risk. And they, so there's, a, there's an issue there. There's a couple of pieces. There's a couple of pieces. So I, I'm saying I've observed very similar stuff to you. And you're even talking about adults, which is a different thing. And it's Men, people who are raised not from. Right, people Which adds another variable of wow. So and you're saying specifically for people raised not from that was the ones I was meaning. Okay, that's meaning. the ones you're meaning. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of pieces here. First of all, I believe, and this is this is a little controversial, but I believe that addiction is a spectrum, and it's fluid. Which means is that people say that's an addict, that's not an addict. I believe we're all addicts. Everybody in the world, we're somewhere on the addict spectrum. Nice. And like I said before. Your self-esteem, for lack of better words, self-esteem is a great word, I think, if you really break it down because it's worthiness and competence together. It's a really solid word. If your self-esteem is really doing well, then your addiction is very low. So the only thing is there are times in your life where that changes. I, my best example, and I've mentioned it before on the podcast, so I hope I don't bore those people, but is that this whole program is built on the concept of Shiva which means you get to a point in your life where you lose somebody who was a tether to, to greatness in your life, like this was your mother, your father. That's what held you together in a certain sense, and that person was ripped apart from you. So in a sense, it's a God-sized hole that just happened. It's like all of a sudden, massive trauma, all your feeling of worthiness and comp I can't do it, I can't do it without them, I can't. All that stuff gets ripped away from you, and you're essentially stuck like you jump from, let's say you're a healthy person, you're like a 20, 30% addict, you all of a sudden you're an 80% addict. Mm -hmm. And us as a community recognize that. And the Jewish community does the most beautiful, I, I think, in terms of mourning, they kick butt. They're incredible. So what the, the community says is we just surround these people with love. They're not allowed to get up, not allowed to do certain mitzvahs, not allowed to do anything, just sit low. Sitting low is symbolic of like, don't move. Stay there. You're there. You're locked in. You're close to the ground, safe as you can. And the and the job is the community. The community now has to hold you. It's on us. It's not on you to get better. It's on us. So the addiction world, and this is getting to your question, but the addiction world is very focused on the addict and how they can fix themselves. The belief, let's say, in our village is the program that I run here, that doesn't even come into play till later on in the recovery game what doesn't come in play? you having to fix yourself uh -huh. when you're so broken that you can't even feel worthy of like living or being that you have to actually use something from the outside to just feel normal just to feel all right you're at a place where well, i consider it you you went back to being a child like you're not able to function emotionally mm -hmm. anything more than a child and hopefully possibly you is connected to this but we'll get into that but the, you're, you're going to that place, and the reason addiction places are failing so much, recovery places, is that they very focused on, like, you need to fix yourself. When they're not even at a place where they even know a reason to want to to wanna fix themselves. Mm -hmm. So they have a tiny reason. It's like they're running on fumes. Like, they'll try, oh, I'll get a job, and then a week later they collapse. And a job, a month later. So it's a constant state of, like, they're not not competent. They just don't have the fuel to keep going. So that's really what it is. So the, like, the philosophy of this program is it's on us. Your whole job in the beginning of this program, and, and they're falling apart, the whole job is try to let us in. We're going to get in, but try. 
try to suspend your disbelief that everybody's going to hurt you and that they we you could be safe and so try to let us in and if you and if you could do that which is incredibly difficult for people who've been hurt with trauma and all that stuff they don't want to let anybody in just let us in slowly and we'll sit there and we'll and we got 50 100 people literally trying to pound their way into your heart to tell you you're special and wonderful mm. that's the whole thing that's what shiva is happening at shiva like you're beautiful. You're wonderful. You don't have any responsibilities. It's on us. We got it. The guys are like, tell me what to do. Do I do this? Do I do it? No. It's not until you recognize it. There's a reason to move forward. There's no moving forward. So that's the gas in the tank. So what I was saying about the Israel thing, which is fascinating, is that majority of what this is, is people coming out of a very unhealthy environment and thrown into a... a, a a whirlwind of love and connection and and all of a sudden meaning takes on a whole like all of a sudden oh there's a god and he loves me and there's a community and i could speak to this rabbi about my issues and he's going to talk to me about it and they need me for a minion and they and like it's just so you're needed you're wanted you're it, all of a sudden you and a lot a lot of people especially from that are coming to jerusalem and that takes us back to the sense of people <laughs> I'm over talking here, but the sensitive people, they're seeking something more. So they're also the ones that become addicts. So they've been in a family, a lot of people, when you're dealing with people, especially Bali Chuva, they've been in a family that something inside them was not being filled. It wasn't being filled. They, they're they feeling broken and they're not getting it. They're not getting that wholeness. And then they show up in Israel, someone gives them some challah, delicious challah, and some chulant, and says, of course I want you at my dinner. Come here. And of course, and of course God wants to talk to you. And you see that wall over there? Go to the wall and talk to God. Like he's right there. And like, so in my opinion, that'll save four to five guys. I mean, just the community. The work we're doing, I actually get criticism for the work I do here because I'm not so heavy on the therapy. Because I'm like, therapy's great for healthy people. Like, I think therapy is amazing if I want to get better. But I already have a very, very strong, loving community vessel to hold me, and then I could go improve myself more. Do you, I don't know yeah. if I answered the question, but I... You I, nailed it. You nailed it. I asked the right guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think about I this stuff. I loved your answer. All day. I loved your answer. It was great. But that leads me to, okay, so that leads me. So this is, I, I'm going to go straight into possible you. Now, I heard you speak on Shabbos. I've heard you speak on videos. Every time, I just, you immediately make me feel like I want to be better, right? Mm -hmm. It does do that. You have something that's very special. Um, my question is this. This is really, it's, it's connected to what I just talked about. I have, I have people, they're not living in a good environment. They're, we call it toxic. I don't love using the word, but let's say they're not living in a great environment. They're not living the way their life needs to be. They're, they're broken. They're feeling all these emotions. They're in their head. They're doing all this. They go to, you know, and I want to hear more about possible you and stuff like that, but they go to a program like I see Tony Robbins or they go to Call the Chauffeur or they go to... Landmark or all these other programs, right? Call the chauffeur. What happened to Call the Chauffeur? <laughs> it, uh, that was controversial, let's just right? It split. It wasn't actually. It split. But it split. I don't really know the inside. This is you're gonna know the inside scoop. Yeah, we're not gonna discuss it. Right. So but, uh, what I anyway, but they they split. But there's still uh, today. There's right. There, it's still out there. Splitting can be good. You know, now there's three or six. Right. And I'll say on this one also, psychedelics, a similar experience. Yeah. Even rehab has that powerful experience. And I call these Harsini experiences. Like you touch the top of the mountain. They're like somehow all of a sudden all, all your guards come down and you could just see the truth that you are a ball of light and love and all that stuff. You yeah. see that, right? That would be what they all have in common. They have, right. They all have in common. And then this is where, where I have, and then you're going to have to tell me, I'm really going to ask you more questions. I feel bad. I'm jumping right into my first major question, which is I'm seeing ton of them going back to their environment and just falling right back down. They're, they're serving the golden calf 40 days later, essentially. <laughs> like they, they were there with God and now they're at the golden calf mm -hmm. and I'm seeing these drops. Right. So I want to know from you, like, first of all, you seeing this, 
what do we do about this? Is it really a problem? I'm just dreaming. Sure. Is it like, it, that's my biggest question about seminars similar to yours. Interesting. And I don't know much about your and seminars, so I'm going to ask more. It might be that's your question. First of all, it's a lot of people's question and right. about all those modalities you mentioned. And yeah. and it's also at perhaps from the perspective of someone who works with addictions question, because in the end you're looking for outcome. Um, though the path of the... I don't know what you'd want to call it, the human potential movement, if you want to call it that, from the psychedelics to the seminars to the... Right. Let's call, let's just call it the human potential movement or the HPM. Human potential is that is that a real word that I don't is, know actually. about? It is. It is. I freaking love it's, it. Yeah, Go it's on. great, but it's not necessarily uh, used okay. a ton, uh, it, but it's used. Okay. Certainly, if you Googled it or went on YouTube, you'd find all the best speakers. And stuff. Oh, okay. Anyway, the... But what I'm going to say, and this, this isn't the rule for every single modality, but but it's it's not necessarily too, it's not outcome-based. Outcome's a bonus, which is a very strange thing to say. Yeah. Especially to someone from an addiction perspective, because, hey, I, I know a few drugs you could take that'll get you, you know... Real high, but really bad outcomes. <laughs> right, <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> outcomes are going to be dead in about 20 minutes, you know. So what does that mean, mm -hmm. not outcome-based? I don't understand that. Yeah, it, right, so. I'm confused. Well, mm -hmm. there's a couple things about it. One of those things is to never underestimate the power of epiphany. Um because all of those modalities have in common epiphany. Epiphany is, uh, it's funny, in the, uh, I'm a mountain biker, and and uh, there was a company, you know, really hand-built, it's called the Ellsworth, uh, and they had, uh, they had a, uh, they had a um, cross-country bike, uh, which is very light and uh, not very good for steep stuff, but really good for distance. And it, very, and it was called The Truth. And they had a downhill bike that was very good for downhill and not very good for a distance called The Moment. And I'm not a cross-country rider. I'm a stimulus junkie. And <laughs> I'm not a... Uh, but, but I do have to climb hills, so I don't want the downhill bike either. I don't want The Moment. So they came up with a bike that's light as the truth. The geometry is more or less... You could get up mountains quite well, actually. And the... But it's got the suspension of the downhill bike. You know what they called it? They called it the epiphany. And guess what their advertisement was? When you have the truth, when you get the truth in a moment, you have an epiphany. How cool is that? It's a good advertisement. These guys great been names, thinking too. Thinking well, man. That's a lot of psychedelics. And the epiphany came out years later. <laughs> yeah, right. It's probably Northern California based. <laughs> right. this place. I really, I think it was Northern California. Although, uh, you know, I don't know where Ellsworth is from. I don't even know if they're still a company. But the um, consequently, by the way, the technology got to the point where every bike you could ride up or down. It's amazing. You could just do everything. They just now. fixed it. Yeah, and now they put motors on the bottom, and so they're pedal assist. Oh, so wow. you're just flying up stuff, and it's just the sport has been transformed. And by the way, anyone listening to this, if you try to get into mountain biking, <laughs> but the mountain bike won. <laughs> You lost the uh, go again on the uh, on the electric mountain bike for the EMTB. It's 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 got an easy entry for the first time in the history of the sport. Anyone can get on a mountain bike and fall in love. Wow! Yeah, and you come back worked. You choose how worked you're going to be, and you're always safe because if you wound up at the bottom of some mountain, you got lost. Just put it in boost mode. And you still got three. You know, you got three hours left of battery. These batteries are huge. Wow. And just get yourself out of trouble. And they're light enough that you that it doesn't make the um, bike harder. There's two. There's a regular weight, and then there's lightweight. And uh, the lightweight ones have a little smaller battery and a little smaller motor. But it's lightweight, so you don't need as much battery because it's less battery going uphill. So they're, they're tinkering now. Actually, that's very important for the Muncie group that listen to this because there's such yeah. great hills here. Holy yeah, I've cow. never mountain bike here. I've always, because I come to the U.S. so much, I've always thought that, Maybe I'm supposed to buy a mountain bike here. 
It's amazing. I mean, I'm sure I could find someone to lend you one. Yeah. You, yeah. As as we'll talk after. As long as you got a motor. Just kidding. I'll get a motor. But once you go motor. It's, yeah, right. You can't, it's got to be a good rhyme for there's that. no way back. <laughs> there's, there's no, so, anyway. Okay, so epiphany. They, don't, oh, underestimate don't underestimate the power, the power of, epiphany. of epiphany. Yeah. Right now, I'm underestimating it, so tell me why not. Because it changed. that's what my question because is. I'm be, underestimating epiphany. Because, because um, epiphany causes a shift. No, it just causes a shift. Like, for example... Um, like for example, the uh, the difference between approval and acceptance, which I'm sure you got wired in rehab type life. Yeah, approval and acceptance. Like most people, never even thought about the fact that they only accept people they approve of. That they only what? I'm sorry. Accept the people they approve of. Right. But acceptance is our oxygen. Like acceptance is the f- uh, love is a function of acceptance. Like if I don't truly accept you. Do you really feel loved? No. No. But if you knew I accept you, I don't give a damn what you ate last week. I don't know. I don't care what you did for Shabbos. Kept it, didn't. I don't care. I I bless you to have the same standards I do on Shabbos, but but I accept you no matter what. I don't, you know I don't need to approve of you to accept you as a human being. Right. A lot of parents are struggling with this. Well, a lot of parents are holding Yiddishkeit like a gun over their kid's head. Right. And they're. But why do I say a gun? Because if acceptance, which leads to love, is our oxygen. Well, then that's a gun. Because if you took away someone's oxygen, you killed them. And they, meanwhile, the parents are, are like looking around at the neighbors and the community, and they're like, oh, man, this kid's starting to embarrass me. And, and meanwhile, that kid just saying, like, you mind if I'm more important than the community f- to you? Right. And like, see how I'm doing here? And maybe, maybe tell me you love me no matter what I do. And then I'd probably be more interested in doing what you're doing. Right. But don't hold Yiddishkeit over my head like a gun with my deepest, most Im- most, most essential need, which is acceptance and love. I just had a conversation with a parent, which was just like, and I got it. I got it. I have kids, and I was like, it's not like I don't get it. You know, it's difficult to watch your kids suffer. Mm-hmm. But the parent said, I cannot watch them do this. And I'm like, are you willing to sacrifice your kids to the altar of <laughs> you cannot watch it? Right. Like that was, to me, is like, you're, you, whether you're watching or not, this kid is really hurting themselves, and you can't watch it, so you're going to do things that make them feel unaccepted. So that was, yeah, like, yeah. it almost like gave me chills. I'm like, oh. uh-huh. like what? Yeah. Like that's, yeah. Anyway, I mean, we, we're professing about God is that, like, there is no such thing as not being accepted from God. Like, if they're, you know, like, no matter you how make bad make standards, but you always are within the realm of his, his compassion. I mean, you're, you're his, you're, you're him. I mean, you're made of him. You're Right. You got a neshuma, you know. That's always there, and it's tahaya. You can't do anything to it. So, so okay, back to... Just one back thing again. I want to yeah, say about sorry. it was that um, I would say a third of the kids that I helped get back on a path of Torah, I never met. Only met their parents. And here I was with these frustrated parents, and they, and I said, I know what you're both saying, and they're like, yeah, yeah. I do. It's, it, the words are, Lama ze anoichi. The words that Rivka said when she was pregnant with Esav and Yago. But her issue wasn't Yago, her issue was Esav. And Lamaza Anoichi. That's and they're like, Yeah, Lamaza, what am I living for? But I asked them, tell me the words, what am I living for? Is that a statement or a question? And then they they started thinking, they're like, they didn't know what to answer. So I said, You're saying it as a statement. So you've just been shooting your foot self in the foot for years. How many kids already went off for you? Two, three. And I'm like, it's not a if it begins with the word Lama, it's an actual question. Lama Zanoich is a question. Sit there silently, and I'm saying to them, I'm asking you, what are you living for? Because what you've been living for has this kid acting out in a major way. And it's most likely you're living for others, meaning how you're seen by others. And until you answer that question, what you're actually living for, you know, your kid's going to suffer. But the second you get that answer, and what most parents answer if they're mature enough, is that. 
to hell with my neighbors and my shul and everything. I'm living for Hashem. I live for Hashem. That's it. My kids, you know, I love them. They should be well, but I'm living for Hashem. And Hashem gave me this child, and I'm going to live for this child as well. And that's what I'm living for. And then the kid senses it vibrationally already that this is no longer about anything but their love for the kid and the fact that they're committed to Hashem. And then the kid many times will find his way back home again. You know. Yeah. I had a, I had a newspaper ask me a question a long time ago, like why I started doing this work and stuff like that. And one of my big inspirations was a letter, a response letter from Rev. Cook. Rev. Cook's answered um, a question that I don't know what the question was because we just saw the response. But the response was, I don't care what all these big rabbis, like basically these so-called rabbis, I don't care how great they were. Was this? It was Rev. Cook. He was oh, answering it to I don't some, care what all these big rabbis. He's like, I don't care that, because apparently someone said these big rabbis suggested this. I'm just asking you also. He's like, I don't care what they say about da 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 I don't remember exactly the words, but there's only one way back, and that's through Ahava. There is no other way back. If they said something else, they're lying, and that's it. You want your kid back? Ahava. That was his whole response. Wow. And I was... I was like blown away, but could we really live that? Like, is that, mm. does that, does that really exist? And everybody like starts talking about boundaries and this and yeah, that. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, uh, you're missing, you're love, missing some yeah. of the point here. Mm. Anyway, with love. So, okay, but you're saying something that actually is blowing my mind, not blowing my mind, but so asking epiphany. questions. Epiphany is very important. You uh, don't have to uh, underestimate epiphany. Create a lot answering. of, create a, if you can create a concentrated amount of epiphany, you can create a shift in a person's experience of life, of themselves and of life. And, and once they're in this new place, which is often another way of saying, like cleaning off the windshield, you know, windshield wiping their, their perspective. So a lot shifts right there already. And what the outcome will be, I don't know. But, you know, I don't know what the outcome will be. But, they, but I have a feeling that they're going to start making some better choices now that they've got an like a incredible dose of clarity. Um, I guess there's a second possibly part of my a, question. Possibly is a little different than the other seminars. Um, and okay, let me get to that yeah, in a second. Yeah. But I think there's a second part of my question. I think the thing that really. So I'll I'll go back to I don't I share sometimes about my psychedelic like my first psychedelic experience and the best way I was able to describe it um, was and someone gave me a better word for it yesterday, which I was so excited about because I didn't have a word for it. Was it was a traumatic experience in a positive way. <laughs> So I didn't know how to say that because trauma, like we always see, is negative. But trauma affects you very little in the beginning, and then, but it knocks you off course. And then 10 years later, you're so far off course because the trajectory is all this negative. It's just constantly building mm. that you're so far off course that you, it like literally destroyed your life, right. even though maybe it could have been readjusted early on or whatever like that. What I found with my first psychedelic experience was that it hit me in a way that I was I knew I'd shifted in a positive way. Right. The and it also was I was very lucky because it gave me homework, which was very, very good. And I was able to follow that homework and, and, and actually make some real significant changes in my life. Mm -hmm. But the actual event was, I guess what you would say, like that epiphany, someone used the word quake talking to this woman and she said it's called a quake like like with an earthquake like something shifted and then that shift could be negative or positive instead of calling it trauma it's like something shifted mm -hmm. we all have times in our life where something wonderful happens and there's a shift you know someone sure. said something beautiful to us so that was my experience so when you're saying it i'm remembering like my epiphany thing and i didn't go to possible you yet so I'll put it on my uh, wish list, but um, I didn't go yet. But with that experience, there was a shift, and then there was this, there was there was growth. So I, I will 
I will, I will, I will definitely hear that. My second, my my follow up question is: How many people I've seen who have gone through these epiphany moments and think the epiphany is the Rebbe? Meaning, like that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I call Rebbe itis. They're coming yeah. back, and they're coming back because they think that the healing is the epiphany. So, like you'll have in psychedelics, guys coming weekly, literally, like you know, like doing making making kiddush on ayahuasca. Like yeah, they're yeah. at that point yeah. um, where they keep going back. And sure. to me, like for me, my experience was because it was such a big gap. I, I got the epiphany, and then I went with it. I mean, I got the Harsi and I moment, and then I did the forty years in the desert. So, like, I got to absorb that and be held by this, you know, this cloud and this fire, and like, I was able to go. I'm finding people go back and back and back and back and back. So, I guess that's that's my second thing is that like, okay, you're gonna have to tell me more I'd like about to speak to the back and back thing a little bit. Yeah, talk to me. So. And I even get into like the possible, yeah, which I want to hear a lot more about. Yeah, I'm happy to. Well, let's do that next. Okay. Um, the back and back and back business, guys. It's a very interesting thing that that you'll notice that high IQ people, and you're going to want to kill me if they're listening to this. Let's go. High IQ people don't go back. I mean, they might go back in a year or, you know, when they feel it's time to shake up the snow globe again and do some more homework, and readjust. Right. That they might do, but they don't go back. And that was really not nice to say. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's going to be a clip. Just letting you know that one. Sorry. <laughs> Um, it's a, that's a four second clip. Now let me add. Yeah, please, let me add fuel to the please, fire. Yeah, <laughs> it gets please, worse. Please, that's such a. I don't even know what to say. It gets worse. I love Two it. more levels. All the right. next level is. All my friends are gonna hate me right now. But yeah. Let me hear what you. Uh, the next level is um, living in a very observant community, but your soul was poisoned in the system of it growing up. Can you elaborate on that one? I will in a second. Okay, so Number three is that there's every human being is either a one primarily, a two primarily, or a three primarily. They're either an intellect. I call them the three eyes. They're either intellectuals, mm -hmm. which means they just want to Google all day or study things or research on YouTube or, or obviously if they're B'nai Taira, which many are because that's what ones love, they just sit in Taira. They don't want to be interrupted by the twos. The twos are interpersonal people. So it's Chabad, Chachma Binadas. These are the Chagas. I'm a Chagas. Like I'm, a, I'm actually enjoying this time with you. Okay, nice. Because yeah, I like being with people. I'm interpersonal. And then there's the last ones that are Nihi, so which are instinctuals. So there's ones, intellectuals, twos, interpersonals, or instinctuals. You either like ideas, people, or things. Stuff. Hmm. Sensory. You'll notice also addicts are generally threes more than twos and ones. Oh, okay. Uh, I have to think about that. They have more, they're more instinctual types. So I'm, I'm heading next to the Schwitz to uh, got a group of men coming. I'm going to lead them in breath work, work on their, you know, do a little body work for them, maybe a little yoga, and, uh, and teach them how to do the cold plunge, you know, how to really stay in, you know, 40 degree water. So, so the, um, cause so I'm a two, three, one. I'm a two. Oh, everybody has all of them. Yeah. But we have a priority. Oh, of, yeah. Okay. So I, we're I, balanced. My wife's a two, three, one, but she's basically 33% of each one, kind of. You know, a little more interpersonal. Then, she, you know, so we, like, we have so much fun together because we always want to do what we're doing together. Because that's your activities. That's your, it's your USB cable right. interface. Right. Mine's people. Then I'm mountain biking, or I'm surfing, or I'm doing yoga, or I just came from yoga just now, or I'm oh. doing yoga, or I'm uh, in Schwitz. Right. And I have to force myself, because whatever's your number three, you got whatever's your last one, you got to stretch. I have to force myself to open Sifrit Koitish. Hmm. You understand? I have to op force myself. So I'm a Chokli Sorel guy. 
Okay. So I get a little of olive tour every day when, before I take off my Rabena tongue to film. Right. And a little at night. So I get day and night. Um, but I'm, I'm just not a one, you know, like I'm a two. Right. And my three is very close. So like my perfect world is being with a bunch of friends in the Schwitz talking about the meaning of life. I'm a two through one. Oh, anyway, wow. So okay. let's go back to the back and back and back and back. I want to analyze myself now. I'm excited about this. I'm trying to figure out what I am as yeah, you're talking. You're, you're, uh, you're, I think, a three, two, one. Three, two, uh, I, I, I would think you the might three be a is two, less. Three, one. Two, three, one might be right. I don't really love stuff so much. Like food? Because of my emotions. I can't figure out how to feed my emotions. <laughs> what kind of car you drive? Oh, this is not fair. What kind of car you drive? A Tesla. You're a two, three, one. <laughs> I have never had a nice car before. The reason I love Tesla, I think, is my is my one. I'm so in love with Elon Musk, I don't know yeah, what to do. That's funny. I'm so maybe crazy about it. I've never had a nice car. Maybe you're a two one three. Oh, I don't even like question. cars. Easy question. Yeah. Do you feel drawn to open Sfarim and do it? Like you actually do it? I wouldn't say Sfarim as much as books, but books. I'm psycho about books. I can't stop. Fiction or nonfiction? Both. Mainly not mainly fiction. How long could you sit and read? Ten hours. Uh -huh. Maybe you're a two one three. <laughs> so then maybe you're a two one three. I think I'm a two one three. I I'm very in my head. I'm very in my head. Then that, that, that doesn't. You're Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah, Jew is yeah. very in his head. And by the way, the amazing thing about the system is that it doesn't matter how smart you are. For example, all wealthy, like big time, killing it, stock traders and businessmen, real estate guys, they're all threes. They're all threes. On the side of structure. Three three to the left side. Structure wow. as opposed to flow. Is this written somewhere as your philosophy? I created this with a chabur of Roche Kolo that I was about 30 years younger than all of them. And we worked on it together for a long period of time, very deeply. And um, I was the one who ran with it. So people can go on tour anytime or YouTube and just look at my 10 Spheros classes. I think the YouTube one has over 80,000 clicks. And it's... Uh, it's the ten spheres of personality. Because think about it. Yeah. The ones are Chabad. The yeah. interpersonals are Chagas. The, the instinctuals are Nihi. And you're either flow or structure. Like, I'm a, I'm a flow guy. Wow. And the businessmen are structure guys. Right. And so, yeah. Okay, let, but let's okay. go back to the back. I will just say, I'd love to, if you had a test, I would love to take it. Well, the test is in the video. Oh, there's a... There's like a I'm asking the whole time, and people are meeting in Chavrusa and stuff. Okay, I, I, love I it, lead I love it, it as a workshop often for companies. Really? I get taken for corporate, and we get together. Sometimes there's, you know, I can take the people far out. I mean, I, I, I had a corporate talk that I thought was the 10, the, the ten spheres of personality, or, or I call it finding your divine factory settings. And so, <laughs> okay. yeah, but they were like Asians in the group. You love words meaning, also. Yeah. You love like putting it into I'm a public speaking, gorgeous you know, words. I'm born, All right, well. I'm born for words. Like It's beautiful. Yeah, and I left school when I was 11. So Really? Yeah, I, I could barely read. I'm, I still can barely read. I, I mean, I can read, but it take me forever. Right. Um, That's funny. What's What age is 11? Uh, fifth grade. What grade? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. But I... Right. But what happened was I noticed that smart people have amazing vocabulary. And I noticed that smart people read a lot. Well, I can't read a lot, but I could start learning vocabulary. So anyone who ever said a word when I was a kid that I didn't know, I was like, what does that mean? And then they would tell me what it means, and I'd just walk away saying that word over and over again, what it means, what it means, what it means, what it means. And just like, more words, more words, more words, more words, more words. And so I'm a very articulate fifth grade dropout. Yeah, I'm a lot of street smarts. Right, I was on the streets for twelve years. Oh, I didn't tell you that. Twelve years. Yeah, from eleven to twenty-three. Eleven to twenty-three. Yeah. But you said you got a high college degree. What's that? GED. You guys said you you graduated college. My father uh, made a deal with me when I was eighteen. He said that he was one of those you know old country guys who right. like, ma the American dream. He couldn't live with himself if I didn't have a degree. So he says to me, when I'm 18, he says, you know, I'm, I want you to go to college next year. And I'm like, how am I supposed to get into college? You're like, you need a GPA, you need tests, you know, yeah. all these things. And, and he just called the mayor of Los Angeles and 
and said, uh, my father was a pretty powerful man. Oh, I was on the streets, but I was sleeping in a mansion. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> in a very loving family. You know. right. and he, anyway, he called the mayor of L.A. and he was just like, um, I, my son needs to go to university. <laughs> university. And two days later, there was a letter on her at her house, you know, saying I've been accepted. And I chose the campus. I chose a campus right. called UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara, which I called You Can Study Buzzed. And <laughs> it, it's a peninsula that sticks out into the Pacific Ocean with surf spots on all three sides. And it's, um, it's the highest population west of the Mississippi. And everyone's between the ages of 18 and 20. Three. Right. Can you imagine the parties? <laughs> What's going on over there? That's great. Whoa. So that's was Is there. that near San Diego? No. 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 San Diego is two hours south of it. Oh, south. And right, right. Two hours north. Of oh, it was two, I was Northern California. Okay. Uh, Central. That's true. San California is so big. <laughs> California's huge. <laughs> it's so San Francisco, they call north. Guess what? In the real geography of San Fran- of California, San Francisco is the middle. It is the middle. It's crazy. I know because it's right on the eighty. Yeah, you got to drive another six hours to get the border. It's to get wild. To Oregon. It's wild. Yeah. I did drive that uh, the, the one. 101 or the, the one. one. The one. It hits the 101 at one point. Baby. It's so beautiful. Oh, my yeah. Lord. We, my wife and I did it in our honeymoon. Really? I remember we got to Santa Cruz. That's when I did it, too. We got to Santa Cruz where everyone's, you know, on LSD or whatever. We, we get out of the car and this hippie looks at us and goes, Welcome here. <laughs> Welcome here. We're like, hey, well, we're here. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great greeting. Welcome here. Welcome here. I actually... I use it. My honeymoon, we bought a $700 car, station wagon, (laughs) and we drove the whole country for six weeks. Mm. We slept in the back. We had no money. It was fantastic. I love it. I love it. (laughs) Unforgettable, right? It was amazing. But that's how we went to... That's when we did the the one. I didn't... I was in California. I wasn't wasn't there for long. I just was driving. Was Molly Chuba in, in... you know, in the middle of the wilderness of the one highway, we were like, we need to be amongst Jidden now. And it, it was him. We, and we just left and went and found for him. Uh, you How'd you find him? You understand? In those days, it was hard to find him. You're a from a Yid, right? Yeah. You, you keep Shabbos here? Yeah, sure. You're from a Yid. I'm a from a guy. What does that mean? If you're not raised in dipped in Shabbos every week and the patterns and the vibrations of the Zemiris and the, and the, and the daily rituals of the washing and the Modianis and the, if you're not in that, you can never really be a Yid. Really? That's but a wild you, you thing You being a Yid is vibrational. That. It's vibrational. Well, think about it. If a guy leaves all of Yiddish guy, yeah, it cuts his hair, turns it purple. Right. You know, disappears for 20 years. Go meet him, I promise you. That's a fry yid. A fry yid. Because you can never really leave. Yeah, I'm a from a guy. And, <laughs> and, but, but you think about our issue. We aren't from. There ain't nothing left. You understand? Why do you think Bali Chuva stick the way they do? They stick. When a person becomes yeah. Chuva, they don't back off. You know, they, all these, Amazing Balchubas that were during that big wave since '67, the Six Day War, till 2007 when it basically ended. Did it end? I, I no, there's plenty of people still be coming from, but the big yeah. wave was. That, that was the big wave. Yeah, the 40 years in the desert, '67 to. 07. Wow, I never heard someone yeah. say that. Yeah. Okay. And the that period of time, which was magical, they're all from today. They're all making weddings. You know, they're all. They, you can't even tell they're Balchuba if they're Litvak. Right. So. Anyway, so okay, so you you were saying that in reference to your when did we're you in the get middle married? of people going back and back and back and back to ayahuasca. What? Yeah, going back. Right, Let me just finish that. Yeah, go back to that. <laughs> I have so many questions about your honeymoon. Psychedelics. <laughs> I want to know about your honeymoon. Okay, whatever. But it was <laughs> no, but we need to get back amongst Jews. How'd you find Jews? Because we're from a Goyim. That's right. And so we need some Yidin around us. You need to be plugged in. It doesn't... We went, I don't know where we went. We, I think we went back to L.A. I don't know. So right. Listen, the... Um, what I want to share with you is... Um, psychedelics mate very well. By the way, I'm not 
an advocate, promoter. I don't do psychedelics. I'm not involved with psychedelics. Yes. But psychedelics mate very well to high IQ people. Very, very well. And they, um, they get a lot out of it. A lot out of it. And a lot of homework, and they do the homework, and they, they are transformed by the experience. In a lower IQ setting, psychedelics are, they may be an amazing experience. An amazing experience. But not necessarily life-changing. And, um, and, and even less ability to integrate afterwards. So now, that, and now add that if you're three, a three right. and instinctual. So psychedelics are very body. There's a big body high and there's like a lot of like sensory and it's like, whoa. And, and then add the, um, the third item, which we said was, um, there are threes. And what was the third item? Oh man, we said uh, three. There was IQ. Right, you had a third thing, but I well, got lost in your second thing. That's the truth. I don't remember. It was our third. Oh, Yiddishkeit poisoned. poisoned oh, by right, right, right. Not Yiddishkeit, but poisoned by the system of Yiddishkeit. Poison them. Now, go back to what psychedelics offer. So you're in, you're raised with spirituality that never was spiritual. So the one thing that all psychedelics have in common is they are, it's a spiritual experience. You can't deny the spirituality of it. People walk in, go in, walk in atheists and come out believers. Right. So, so now we have a spirituality. We have a sensory overload of good feeling. And lastly is, is we have, um, we have, um, <laughs> those three things again. Um, oh, the, you were talking about the toxic. No, 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 no. So you have the spiritual. That takes care of the toxic. Right. You have the three, the sensory experience. And then, oh, oh no, it doesn't, it's not necessary for the IQ business, but, but the, um, because I can't integrate, I don't integrate this so well, yeah. Because right. I'm not necessarily such a great integrator to begin with, because threes aren't great integrators. Right. Uh, their epiphanies don't have the same uh, conversion into integration. Right. They, um, they find themselves back and back and back and back. Did you think I was going to be able to treat this question so well? This is great. <laughs> you thought what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. And we got a truckload of, of threes in you're the gonna have a community. You know, a lot of my dumb friends are going to be very angry at these. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, they should. If they hear it and it hurts, anything that hurts is usually true anyway. Yeah. So if you hear it and it hurts. And by the way, having a low IQ in the Jewish world still means you're like one, you're like 10 decimal points above right above the entire planet i mean and that's not me being racist just go to see the research yeah the research just by being crazy. jewish you're already an entire index point above the rest of the planet on iq so we're not discussing low iq here oh right. this had nothing to do with low iq really. right 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 this had to do with a normal iq so the integ because it's such a powerful experience and they're not integrating it, they're they're just wanting to go back and experience it again. It's the thing they always miss growing up when the rebbies who were teaching them in Chayder were saying was so great that they never threes don't understand why it's so great. Right. When they're in Chayder. Right. Not to mention getting sliced and diced by the by, you know, the conformity that you know, the individuality was was circumcised <laughs> okay so what what is possible you like okay a lot of the stuff you're saying is awesome i'm just loving it but i want to know what possible you is like what is that is it possible we could take a one minute break yeah we could take a many minute break if one you want only. go for it <laughs> anyway we're back okay so what is possible you that's where i ended <laughs> it's too <laughs> broad a question should we this is too old time. Okay. I'm going to change the question. No. <laughs> what is what is possible you? What is it? Um, I, I care a lot about people. And I've done a lot of thinking for a lot of years. Ever since I was a little kid, two things happened. One was everyone would tell me everything 
you know, I'd be skiing and I would figure out I could get back to the top of the mountain much quicker if I ski alone because I can join other people on the, you know. And I'd be seven, eight years old and some lawyers, you know, told me his entire life story by the time we got off the lift and then I would just do it again and hear the whole life story of someone else and someone else and someone else. They, they can't not do it. It's a weird thing. Since I'm little, so I've been hearing about people and what they're going through since I'm born, basically. That's what it feels like. And and I don't know what that is. I never was able to identify why that's the case. The So hearing that for years, the other thing is that um, I think the good example would be that my, I went to ball games. My father had the best seats of every single game, and I always came with binoculars, and he would say, you don't need binoculars for this kind of seat. And he didn't realize I was not interested in the sports. And I'm an athlete, I mean, I love sports, but there's something I love more, and that's people. People, And I took those binoculars, and I would watch the other side of the stadium. And I had everyone marked, like, that father hasn't even talked to his son since last quarter. That couple's not getting along. I could see it in their faces. And I would watch them desperately that they should somehow hurt people, which never happened because I identified them well as people who were stuck in their, in their lives and, and hurting. And that's all I did. I did I, this is every single game. I mean, it was every single Rams game. It was every single Raider game. It was every single Laker game. It was every single Dodger game. And it was everywhere I went. My parents knew if they can't find me, just go out of the building we're in or out of wherever we are and look up. And you'll either see me on the roof of the building staring at people or you'll see me on top of the gigantic eucalyptus trees in our house watching people walk by. And I've been studying how to bridge people to themselves, to one another, and to Hashem. Now, it took me 23 years to find the Hashem part, but I'm pretty damn good at it because I'm good at the other ones. It's bridging people to themselves, first and foremost. Bridging people to one another. And it's like, I'll come back to the seminar today, to f or, and especially tomorrow, to have people share that they have called their father or their mother and really ended a very, very long, painful decade or two decades of, of not really sharing their life with them and because when they finally got back them they could get back everything else and the possible you no matter who you are and this is back to the one twos and threes one's not going to be a big problem although they do get stuck in their head and I speak to that during the seminar at the very beginning intro the twos are going to be great but there's a lot of threes. Threes are like 45% of people. And their their track record in personal growth sucks. You know, they're just not great at it. They don't get too far. Um, they, they get there. It's spaced out. It's four, four days together. You know, we know each other like our own smell by tonight. Tonight's the third day in Muncie. Um feel safe to you know after a while and they start loosening up feel safe again but they there's time then there's four weeks follow up to integrate it and I have follow up leaders in each city or in five cities we have one in Jerusalem London and Muncie Lakewood and Borough Park and then we do one offs we get brought to other cities for one offs other countries um, they have a four week follow up with an an excellent follow-up leader. Everyone has a one-on-one -on -one coach for the duration of the experience to take them through it on a one-to-one -one level. Um, it's, it hits people vibrationally in places they just would never understand and it would take me an hour or two to explain. But it's hitting you in a vibrational place that's way, way below the, way, I mean, it's way under the radar of, of uh, something that anyone can understand psychologically. I mean, one of the phone calls I got right before we started was like, am I okay? 
I get the guy was wondering if he's okay because he was like, I signed a waiver. And I'm like, I'm starting to, things are starting to feel different all of a sudden. Am, am I okay? Right. And so I, you heard me. I was asking him about, do you have history of X, Y, and Z? Because if someone does have history of uh, any uh, a mental illness, psych psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, and, um, then it's not, they need not apply because it's hitting people on a vibrational level. That's, that's, um, that's very deep, and it's it's uh, questionably safe for for anyone who's who's got a diagnosis like that, family history. Now, obviously, if they're above the age where that no longer comes, meaning they're already in their late twenties, and it, it's no longer uh, so. Even with family history, once they're in their late twenties, thirties, when it's no longer shy to be spending time worrying about it, usually hits at the eighteen to twenty-six. Right. Anyway, the um, but it, it the possibility of works in a very very deep vibrational place. So who would be I feel bad for these poor guys because they have no idea what's going on in there, and they have no idea what I'm up to this whole time. I'm doing brain surgery, but but the the last thing is is that the possible you. And this is where it would connect to psychedelics in a way, even though there's obviously no one's ingesting anyone. I want people sober. You're not allowed to. Um, by the way, you're not allowed any. Um, mind-altering substances whatsoever during this right. period. And the, um, the, the other thing it does is the, the, the default mode network, which is between the right and left lobe, which is the, the, it's the, its job is basically to narrow perspective. You know, when you're going 20 miles per hour, you can, like, see the birds flying over Muncie, and, you know, you might even see some deer or something, but once you're going 40, they're cut out, you know. Right. And you're going 60, and now <laughs> even the conversation's getting cut out if you're doing 70 a month. So you're, everything's cut out. You're right. really going to be. So our brain has a self-limiter um, for for obviously car crashes, <laughs> but it, it self-limits also for rejection, which means social, mm. social anxiety, and so it starts self-limiting there. Um, it's going to do the same exact thing for, for failure, like meaning my own ability to perform in this world, fit, fear of failure. Mm -hmm. It does the same thing also for being controlled by others. What does that mean? It could be anything. It could be your father, your father-in-law. It could be your cops, government taxes, askanim, uh, rebbes, mashkichim, you know, right. your kids mashkich. So what does the brain do with the... It will um, It'll go into survival mode and... Uh, the first thing the brain does when it's in survival mode, meaning w like 70 miles per hour, now you're right. in survival mode. So what happens is you start, you go away from your life experience and you go into conceptualizing. Meaning if I'm going 70, I want to be very conceptual right now. Meaning I want to take this 18 years of the 20 years of driving experience from my past and throw it down that highway and turn everything into a video game of probabilities based on past experience. And so if I walk into a wedding, I'm not walking in there at four miles per hour. I'm walking in there at 65. Right. Because now it's like every rejection I've ever had is, is now my perspective gets narrowed. I don't really hear the band. I'm not really tasting the food. I'm busy listening only to see what I can say next. And my whole perspective has changed. I'm, I'm conceptualizing the people that I'm talking to. You know, like how quickly can I figure out who this, what is his game? And put them in a box, label it, rib, put a ribbon on it, and shelf it so I can survive this guy's wedding. Right. And it's interesting. It's one of the reasons I like podcasting. You're, like, stuck in this conversation. There's nowhere you, like, you can't go anywhere. Right. You're here. Right, right. And, like, there are points during the podcast where I feel what you're saying. Like, like everything's spitting by. Like, we're, uh, we're, you know, like going a little bit in survival mode, but you have to like come back. You have to come back so you can be in that conversation. Yeah, that's very interesting. So possibly you, what I'm doing the whole seminar is it's a technology where I'm fiddling with the default mode network that's vigilant to protect you from hot pots, car crashes, getting cut when you're using a knife. That's vigilant to shut everything off so I don't get hurt here. But I'm fiddling with it so it only works for highways and knives and hot pots. That's when the default mode network does its job. We're but it shuts it off when it comes to enjoying a kiddish or or 
or being in a business meeting or, you know, that's failure or, or coming up with a business plan or that's, you know, viable or whatever. And, uh, or dealing with authority. And the, the kicker is the fear of the unknown, which is every minute. Like, do you know what's coming up in a minute? No, no one does. But how many of us have our entire life designed to insulate ourselves from the unknown? We're like, we're like known addicts. How much can I make sure it's known? You know? And meanwhile, Hashem doesn't play that game. Hashem plays the unknown into the known, into the known, unknown to known, unknown to known. You're not supposed to be sh- quaking at the unknown. You're supposed to be dancing with it. And the possibly graduates start dancing with the unknown. The unknown's their best friend because it's the infinite coming into the finite. And it's, it's where you, exactly where you want to be. So you're saying you could, you could, let's say, I mean, you get that from going to the seminar. Yeah. And... And everyone gets it. Okay, and you get it. You get it. How do I hold on to that? How do I hold on to that? You know, why don't... uh, Let's talk in psychology terms a little bit. Like, we're we're dropping all these defenses. We're dropping them. My experience is I could drop for a little while, and they snap back up. Sometimes even harder, which is sort of the question. How do I hold on to... That's not terrifying. That's My first question is, who cares? Because for many people, this is the first time they've ever tasted experience mm. as opposed to conceptual. There's a, you're either living conceptually or experientially. Right. So many people are tasting ex- the experiential for the first time. That alone is worth the money and the time. Okay. I mean, Just to experience. got taste buds, man. Let's the lightning in the forest. Yeah, let's use it. I know there's, there's a way. No, not even that. I know That's that what I'm saying. No uh, outcome. Just to experience it. Like, imagine a kid. There are li- most people imagine going a poor kid lives in the something? flatlands, and and you live on the top of the Swiss Alps, and you just finally say to the kid, you know, jump me. I want to show you something. And I would want a video. I'd want to make a YouTube video of his face when he sees it. Right. He's going back to the flatlands. By the way, our seminars, we do a ton of work to make sure they can integrate to live it. Right. You saying oh, well, even I'm, if you I'm, didn't, I'm talking to them blue in the face and giving them s- tools and skills, and and they they get a book. Everyone gets a book of everything I said, and they review the book, and they they have they have uh, uh, what you would call sponsors in addiction. We have what are called beacons. Beacons. Like if you get buried under the snow and your blinders came back on, you call your beacon and you say, "Listen, I'm going to this business meeting, but like I'm I'm way back to like all my negative beliefs have come up, and I'm like not I'm not in it." I'm not experiential right now. I'm conceptual. Right. Oh, so I have another. I have another. We have a lot I have an set answer. up for the outcome. We, we're building up. I know, but let me answer the who cares thing. Just yeah. Because I thought about it a second. Took down the walls. I'm back in. Mm-hmm. Um, most people who go and spend money to be part of these programs are thinking, I care. They're thinking outcome. Right. Yeah. And then what I think is what you're saying is very beautiful, and I would love to just experience it. But, and, and, not but, and all these people who are who are going in are walking in with this massive expectation that change is going to happen. Right. And, and my then, job is to get rid of that. So part of it is like, you need to not be thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm I'm liking that. Any integration you get from the most beautiful experience you've ever had in your life. Not to mention it's probably, you'll be on seminar high for a couple weeks too. Right. Everyone's on seminar high for a month or two. Right. So it's not just the beautiful experience of the four days. It's great for like a while, you know, like, wow, you know, you're tasting the apple. You're seeing, my, my guys, they lift up their Kiddush cup, Lil Shabbos. They look across the table. They see their kids. They see their wife, and they're like, "Look at their wife," and they're like, "Will you marry me?" And she's like, "I think we're married." And he says, "If he's Hasidic, he says, now that was a deal between our parents. I'm asking you to marry me right now.'" Of course, all the girls at the table, his daughters, are like turning red. Their wife's like, and she looks up and she says, "Yes, finally, I'm waiting." Is that not worth the money? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So 
So the I like the idea that yeah, you, you don't need it. anything. Yeah, you got it. No, but I, I my frustration is all the people that are like I got to this seminar and then I went to this seminar and I went yeah, to this yeah. seminar and I went to and people I, aren't I'm like still this way. People aren't like that with Fosfia. They're not like that. They're like they're just thankful. They're full of gratitude. I get unbelievable amounts of gratitude. Unfortunately, I'm like a bottomless pit with gratitude. So like you like bring more. That's no, the opposite. <laughs> no, I, I don't need it. And uh, when I get it. It just seems to go out some of tube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love it when I'm getting it. It's beautiful. But not why I'm not why I'm in this game. And and secondly, you know, not anything else. And and you should also know and I'm not it's not a you know, every husband, especially the Satmir, is like, you know, like he's in this for the money. Right. And it only takes him about an hour or two until they start realizing this guy doesn't know the first thing about money. Right. You know, not, cool. they t- like really, because the, they get people quickly, very quickly. Right. Which is part of, it. you know, each community has their thing. So it takes them about an hour to realize that this guy doesn't give a damn about money. And right. and the also, you know how many seminars are run for free just taking care of overhead? Wow. You know, there's a lot of people working here. And yeah, I'm trying to figure out where you're getting all the people from. you traveling around. They come uh, with you or they, some, they're around? Sometimes. They're, they're usually per city. Um, our staff. I have staff in each city. So there's a lot of overhead. I can run three seminars in a row, which means I'm pumping it out for 25 hours over those four days. You know, it's non-work hours, by the way. Right. So Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. So I'm, I'll be pumping it out. And one or two of them once in a while knows, you know, the back, back story of the finance, finances. Right. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, he just knows. And whatever, I'm close to him and I, my finance guy, and but he never did the seminar. And he does the seminar, and he looks at me, and he's like, You just flew here and did that. You're not gonna see a single penny, are you? <laughs> no, nothing. Yeah, well, I relate to that a lot. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, nothing. And he's like, What are you up to, man? <laughs> and I'm like, What are you doing here? That's awesome. But you go back to my childhood, you know exactly what I'm doing. Oh, so I gotta get it's so so many things you said I like about your childhood that are very similar to me. I kind of, well, I didn't, um, I don't even really talk about it much. It's not like, uh, but I kind of finished school in fourth grade and went back in graduate school. <laughs> so similar. it's similar. Is I skipped fifth, <laughs> um, and then I never went back. Mm-hmm. So I never even went to fifth. I went to like, uh, like a minute of fifth. And then, <laughs> and then, then they skipped me. And then I was, then I just was you were out. done. I was done. I went to the, actually at sixth grade, I decided to go and like learn Russian because all the Russians were coming <laughs> to America. And I was like, all these people I don't know how to speak to. And I get all these cassettes, how to learn Russian. And I, that's what I did. And like, instead of going to school. Do you speak like, Russian? No, not at all. It's a disaster. That <laughs> was sixth grade. That <laughs> was sixth grade. I could say a lot of greetings and stuff. They weren't. I think the technology of teaching languages have gotten a lot better Probably, too. Because yeah. it was like, this is how you say, Dobre utra. Good morning. Mm. Anyway, okay. The, but a lot of my experience also being on the street and stuff like that. But I'm going to let you, I, I have to let you go. But I definitely would love to explore that maybe another time. I want to ask you. So, uh, yeah. Is there something that you'd kick yourself that we didn't s- talk about? Or you're feeling mm. satisfied? No, I'm feeling satisfied. But I, I, I feel like I, I did want to hear a little bit more about how this happened to you. Like how, like your experience and what led you here. I was curious. I'm always curious about someone who decides to take on, I don't know how to say it, but the yoke of Torah. <laughs> well, I, I'm always interested to about that. like that. Yeah, to become observant. I had gone off and come back, so, like, it was, it was you know, but, like, again, the vibrations were happening. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend who called himself an FFBBT, a friend from birth, Baal Taiva. Yeah. So they, it was, like, uh, it, it was, like, it, it was deeply in my system, and I, I woke up to it again. And it, whatever, maybe I'm going to do that again a couple of more times in my life. But that's a whole different, that's, no, a, whole, <laughs> that's a whole different discussion with my wife. So... <laughs> Whether she lets, I have to I have to find out. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully not. But okay, the one last thing I'll ask you because you got to get going. <laughs> now you want to get into. Now you want to get in. Trouble. Now you want to get into it. <laughs> okay, what do you want? Um, the last thing I want to ask you is um, rooftop moment. 
if you're like, you know, let's say a million people listen to this and you like, you get to like shout something from the rooftop. Like what's the, the message that we got to take away from your life experience and everything? Uh, like it's like it's a final lot. message. Yeah. No the final problem. message is something like, oh man, if I could just yell this from a rooftop, I just would. Should I say it into the camera? If you want to be dramatic, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Either way, the videos look good. You have to surrender. Put up a white flag. Between what you're saying about yourself to who Hashem made you. You're crueler to yourself than your enemies. Your enemies, you'll narrow it down to one word like jerk. But with yourself, there's like categories of what you're willing to say about yourself in your 60,000 thoughts a day, 3,500 thoughts an hour, completely unfiltered. Your beauty is so deep and true and real and unbreakable. Your power is from an infinite source. Because you're a chaylik and a kamimal, you're part of God. You're, incre you're an incredibly awesome person. But something's got to break for you to get there. You, something's got to... You, you you you're going to have to give something up to, to live it, to have it. And you're likely not going to be able to get there on your own, so get help to get there. But y you are so beautiful. And the work I've been doing for all these years is only because... <sighs> it's because I got sick and tired of being told how amazing I am by the person I'm looking at, who's the most amazing person I've ever seen. It bothered me a lot. And... I just had to do the research and do the thinking and do the work on myself as also to get to how can I get the person to understand how awesome they are. And I succeeded. I don't know how, but I succeeded. And then it constantly evolves. And most of my success is the feedback I got. Because I'm an instant feedback person. You give me feedback and you'll see it in the next seminar. It's really in the, And it's really your seminar. Because it's it's built off the feedback of this rutzon of mine to get you to the amazing person that you are. Stop looking at the time factor of what it takes to come in. Stop looking at the money factor. It doesn't matter. You're worth it. Nothing's more important. Because anything that you would think is more important is going to be like 10x more awesome based on you generating from that beautiful, clean place, you know, nothing on the, on the, on your lenses, you know, clear. I do my best to make it as easy as possible, and certainly as fun as possible to experience this while having this transformation take place. And you're worth it, and there's people counting on you. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for them. Beautiful, man. <laughs> I'm ready, baby. I'm ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you for this day that I've been given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this chance. Thank you for this chance to live a new